A one megaton thermonuclear weapon detonation begins with a flash of light and heat so tremendous it is impossible for the human mind to comprehend. 180 million degrees Fahrenheit is four or five times hotter than the temperature that occurs at the center of the Earth's sun. Where did you get that? I've never seen that number. And where'd you get and, and to pick pick it up pick up the story there. What happens? Yes. And how do you know? Well, like everything in the book, you should be able to go to the back and answer that question, where did you get that? That particular number, the temperature comes from uh, Ted Postel, who is a professor emeritus at MIT. But when he was younger, he advised the chief of naval operations at the Pentagon. He's kind of one of the world's leading experts in missile technology and nuclear weapons effects. He's one of the first people that wrote about what megafires would do to people, to landscapes, to things after a nuclear bomb explodes. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of what I've read is just secondary. And so when you undertook to write this book, one of your things is you actually go out in the field and, and talk to the real people, which is, you know, really uh, makes it so much uh, more interesting and important. How did you decide when you set out to write this book, like, well, this has already been done, that's already been done, what can I do that's original, and what is new? This is not like an encyclopedic history book. Um, it is a scenario moving forward from the first second after launch through to nuclear winter. The book takes place in three acts, good old Shakespeare, you know, three 24 minute acts, because that is how long it takes for a nuclear war to unfold. And mind you, that's not like my imagination. That comes from a direct quote from former STRATCOM director, uh, sorry, former STRATCOM commander, General Keeler. And when we were discussing nuclear war and exchange between Russia and America, what that would look like, he said to me, Annie, the world could end in the next few hours. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> I know, it's just, it's astonishing. How much more is still classified? Do you, do you have a sense? I mean, you don't know what you don't know, but did you get a feel like I'm close to knowing what everybody knows, but there's still some left over there we don't know. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you know, as is the case with a lot of my books, I'm reporting on the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And I'm always amazed that, you know, when my books publish, and of course, you know, Michael, I'm a popular author because I get read by the generals and the admirals in the Pentagon, yes, but perhaps more important to me, the little old ladies in South Dakota or the guys who listen to Joe Rogan. I like writing for the people. I do not think these subjects should be rarefied and, you know, kept behind the veil. And so interestingly, people always have this revelation that, you know, I have somehow unearthed the world's classified secrets writ large. And in fact, yes, there are things in my book, certainly that were never reported anywhere before. But a lot of what I report is actually declassified information that people stopped paying attention to. That is where I get the great joy out of working with sources, people who were firsthand witnessing to these events. From my other books, The Pentagon's Brain in particular, I interviewed the eg and engineers who actually wired, timed, and fired the thermonuclear bombs in the Pacific, in the Marshall Islands. Um, they were, you know, in their 80s and some of them in their 90s, and they told me what it was like to witness that, of course, from like 50 miles out on a ship. But it's through those firsthand experiences, through the interviews that I conduct with people who were there, that I tend to gain access to really interesting parts about history, maybe anecdotal, maybe buried, maybe forgotten. In any event, not right there front and center what everybody's talking about. And so that is really the great you know, privilege of mine to be able to interview 
people who kind of call themselves the cold warriors and bring their stories to the light of day. Yeah. Okay, let's start with the the, the start where you start. There's, let's say, uh, Kim Jong-un or, or somebody launches a nuke, and we have a satellite that can detect rocket launches. So how do they know that it's one of the nuclear rocket launch nuclear <laughs> rocket launches, and it's not just some other normal one? Is there a reporting, like all countries report, we're launching a rocket today, Elon has to call in and go, well, this is not a nuclear uh, missile we're sending up? Mm -hmm. What a great question. And I love that you're asking that you, the scientist, right? And then you're revealing perhaps that you don't know. And I love that because then it helps everybody else who realizes they don't know either to realize that there's like nothing, you know, wrong with like not knowing things and that you can actually learn them pretty easily. So I simply ask those questions and then I learn and then I relay it. And the, the answer is that the hot rocket exhaust that comes out of the back of the rocket is different in size and measurement than a smaller rocket, which suddenly now makes perfect sense. And you realize, wow, I don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand rocket science. And so what is remarkable is when you start really drilling down on the technology behind it. The, the system that you mentioned is called SIBRS. Of course, everything in the government is an acronym, and that stands for Space-Based Infrared Satellite System. And the SIBRS system in Geosync is essentially parked above America's adversaries and enemies, certainly the ones that are nuclear armed, watching for a launch 24-7, 365 days a year. And to your question about measurement, so think about how incredibly complex and powerful the sensor systems are in space. They're like the size of a car, for example. The satellite system is like the size of a flying bus. But the sensors that are looking down are so powerful, they can see from space. And we're talking about one-tenth of the way to the moon is geosync. They can see and measure the plume. And then that data is processed at incredible speeds and sent back down to these three nuclear command bunkers and the Space Force and NRO and NSA. The whole nuclear command and control apparatus is notified of this data after launch. And now, by the way, we're into just a few seconds of the scenario. That's how fast this all happens. And how accurate is it? Is there some percentage of false positives that they worry about? That, I would say, is most certainly a classified I piece see. of information, <laughs> right? So that's where, you know, same as the CIA has its sources and methods, the Defense Department certainly has technical matters having to do with measurements and trajectories classified. But you can get a sense narratively, you know, if you just apply your poetic brain to thinking about how this all happens. Yeah. Okay. So it's up, it's moving. How many minutes uh, does the Pentagon or whoever have to decide that's a, a hit and not a miss? And we got to call the president or whatever happens next. So Richard Garwin, the designer of the thermonuclear Ivy Mike bomb, and Ted Postal, the missile expert, spend a lot of time on this issue. They shared with me countless monographs that they've written on exactly this and also maps, one of which I reprinted in the book so that you can see, you know, really in a sense that, that makes that makes it easy to comprehend the missile launching from Pyongyang. And then you can see concentric circles, which measures shows how many seconds. Okay. So it's something like uh, by, within 120 to 150 seconds, the defense department can discern if that missile is going to Moscow or to Honolulu. And then shortly, a number of seconds after that, it can figure out whether it's headed to San Francisco or the East Coast. And so what I found remarkable in reporting this is as I'm kind of doing all those numbers, it's what is happening to me as a reporter is then I'm thinking of all these other really dramatic situations. For example, Okay, so we also I also learned from North Korean missile experts here in the United States, so rather people that study North Korea's missiles, 
that North Korea is the only nuclear armed nation that doesn't announce its missile tests, right? So the big ballistic missile tests, Russia, you know, you you tell your nuclear armed neighbors because no one wants to start a nuclear war by accident. Sometimes they're even suspended during the, in the early days of the Ukraine war, the Pentagon postponed an ICBM test and so did Russia. North Korea, on the other hand, doesn't play by anybody's rules. They have fired over 100 missiles since January of 2022. So once you have the information that I just, that we just were discussing about these seconds to determine the trajectory of the missile, you suddenly realize what is going on in those command and control centers in those first 120 seconds. Then I'm able to take that question, or rather that part of the scenario, to those who are in the know and are in those rooms and say, wait, is is this really as crazy, you know, crazy feeling as it would seem to me, the outsider, the journalist? And they say, absolutely. And then they fill in the details. And that's what you get in the scenario. You get information that has been pieced together by all the different experts that would be in any of those rooms as I take you from nuclear launch to nuclear winter. Right. Okay. So they've decided it's a hit and then they call the president and and uh, say, okay, how many? And he says, all right, how many minutes do we have to decide? Not quite yet there. Okay. So here's an interesting thing to think about with regards to the bunkers, you know. So there are three main nuclear command and control centers. They are bunkers, nuclear bunkers. One is inside of Cheyenne Mountain. You've seen it in the movies. The other is beneath the Pentagon. It is called the National Military Command Center. And the third is in Omaha, Nebraska, beneath Offutt Air Force Base. The way it was explained to me was that Cheyenne Mountain is the brain. The Pentagon is the beating heart of nuclear warfare. And STRATCOM, the bunker in Nebraska, is the muscle. And so now that you have that sort of anthropomorphization of nuclear command and control, you realize what those different command centers are kind of tasked with doing. And again, they're working with all kinds of partners, Space Force, National Reconnaissance Organ- Office, NSA, uh, the Missile Defense Agency. They're all working to kind of categorize, to tr- first track and then categorize the nature of this threat. And once they have a handle on that, they are preparing to present that information to the president. And so in the scenario, it is just a couple minutes until the president is first notified that this is happening. And then once secondary confirmation comes in from a ground radar system, the president will have six minutes to launch a counterattack. And is that the only response, short of just alerting people uh, where the target is to get out or get underground? And what a great fantasy you just revealed. There is no alerting the people. There <laughs> right. is no alerting the people. And you can take that from uh, the chief himself, meaning um, I, for that part of reporting the book, I interviewed President Obama's FEMA director, mm. Craig Fugate who would be the person in charge of informing the people. Except but wait, for their... it says right here in your book that, that uh, here's a map of what to do. <laughs> That's more folly, right? That, that, that is yeah. in there meant to be sad and tragic irony. Yeah. Because it is completely useless. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just a remarkable set of jaw-dropping revelations, I think, reading the book, and certainly it was for me reporting the book, meaning, you know, interwoven throughout this scenario are the policies regarding nuclear war, which seem, you know, bananas, if I may just borrow from Mm -hmm. modern culture, because that's what they are, um, interwoven with a lot of really dangerous technological problems and oversights not necessarily just within our system, but with our adversary systems. 
that can lead to all kinds of unraveling. And of course, that's what happens in the scenario I write. Yeah, well, I'm old enough to remember the duck and cover. Let's see, I was in grammar school 61 through 66. Yeah, we had the uh, once a month or whatever it was, quarterly drills where the alarm came on and we had to get under our desk. That was always bullshit. Did they know this was never going to make a difference? Or did people actually believe, what if it's a tactical nuke or something smaller? Maybe you can survive if you're indoors or under the desk or something. You know, that is a really interesting question. And, and you know, I, I did so much homework understanding how we got here to report the book. I condense it all into a very short part of the book called How We Got Here, right? Where I take you through this fast. But in learning about that, it was just, you know, remarkable to consider that when these nuclear war plans first came to be and the nuclear arsenals grew from a couple of bombs to thousands of bombs to tens of thousands of bombs, the idea among the generals and the admirals at the Pentagon was that nuclear war would be fought and won and that the people would, you know, magically go into these bunkers and these underground shelters and survive. And by the late 50s, early 60s, that was, of course, revealed as sheer nonsense. And the Pentagon began to change its position. It, it changed its position saying, no, new, you know, now we'll have a new, a new defense and it will be called deterrence. And that is what exists now, so that nuclear war will never be fought. We will just simply have all these nuclear weapons so that we will never fight a nuclear war because we would all die if we did. And another big part of the book is pointing out that that itself is madness, you know, that we are all asked to accept this paradox. Uh, it's really more like an like a Orwellian catch-22 that more nuclear weapons make us more safe. Yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> after reading your book, I went back and rewatched Dr. Strangelove, just such a great film <laughs> where they have that discussion about the mine shafts. So the Russians are going to go in these mine shafts uh, and survive and then reproduce. And, uh, and, and then George C. Scott character. So, you know, there's a mine shaft gap. We have to catch up on the mine shafts. I mean, there obviously is just making fun of this whole thing, but um, you know, they must've at some point really, believe that. You know, that carried on throughout the Cold War. And interestingly, where I found some interesting, I think, new reporting um, was in the concept of North Korea's bunker system. And when I say new reporting, I mean like it was there, but it was sort of deeply buried. And the North, you know, North Korea has this profound system of underground tunnels, not for the people, but really for the, the, you know, the family. And it stems back to the grandfather who got from his Soviet benefactors, we're talking in the 50s, not only technology, not only digging equipment, but engineers, Soviet engineers, who built for him the beginnings of this warren of underground bunkers that the Defense Intelligence Agency now believes um, the current dictator spends an awful lot of time inside and would go to, you know, in the event of nuclear conflict. And I think, you know, sometimes things make the most sense in anecdotes. There's a terrific North Korean expert here in the United States named Michael Madden. And he sh he watches the, the Kim Jong-un family, you know, incessantly and like looks at uh, photographs and can interpret so much information from who's looking at who in what manner and what they're wearing. And, you know, the intelligence community really leans on him for information is how I understand it. But the best detail I, I got from him, meaning like the most resonant to me, was that the that Kim Jong-un has a boring machine, a drilling machine that he keeps with him or nearby so that in the event he goes into a nuclear bunker, 
He can drill himself out because that may, in fact, be one of the only ways that the Defense Department can keep eyes on him through satellites is by seeing tunnel entrances. So he's trying to kind of like, you know, like one up uh, the U.S. satellite systems watching him by being ultimately able to dig a new tunnel out that is never that can't be seen from above. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so even if the president countered a strike against North Korea to decapitate the government, it probably wouldn't, you know, because he's probably a thousand feet underground or something. There's all these kind of fiery statements over the decades from the various leaders of the country uh, indicating that that's exactly right, that there there is a real sense that survival would be underground. Yeah, we've seen with um, uh, with the Hamas tunnel system how extensive it can be. And of course, in Iwo Jima and Okinawa, the Japanese uh, tunneled into the volcanic um, uh, ash or whatever that, that substance is, pumice, I guess. Uh, pretty extensive tunnels. You know, since you end with Gobekli Tepe in the book, we'll come back to that. But there's another site near Gobekli Tepe that is an underground city that is could have housed like thousands of people that were like 100 feet underground. That's like 10,000 years old. So yes. th- this, I'll come back to this because Graham Hancock thinks it's all part of this dealing with the equivalent, their equivalent of nuclear war, which is like an asteroid or comet strike or something like that that could have wiped them out. That people are able, to, but the point is that, that tunneling underground is a definitely a safe thing or a, a protective thing to do under massive uh, threat like that. Well, it's also so you know fundamentally human, right? And if we just think of our like hunter gatherer ancestors, and you think of caves and cave art, and that is what I get to in the end of the book because you know a lot of questions that have come at me while while I've been talking about the book have to do with. You know, how depressing it must be thinking about all this death and nuclear war. But I think threading throughout this narrative and really all of my narratives is a rather hopeful sort of more optimistic idea about how incredible science and technology is to all of us and how it has, you know, we have we have just changed our world and the possibilities therein are endless. And it's why I love, you know, the Einstein quote where he's alleged to have said, I don't know what weapons World War Three will be fought with, but World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. And that kind of clarion call to like, wake up, people. You guys are so civilized. We've come this far in, you know, the 12,000 years since Gobekli Tepe, since we were hunter-gatherers. And the thought that we would just zero it all out, out of our own aggressive hubris, is really, I mean, you could think of it two ways. It could become very depressing, or it could become rather hopeful. You could say, you know what, um... People really have to get it together and will get it together. And and I'm a born optimist. So, of course, I take that approach, uh, even at the risk of being called a Pollyanna. I do, too. I don't think it's Pollyannish, though. I think there there is a way to get to nuclear zero. I think it's just really difficult. Um, you know, and also it, it didn't have to be. I was thinking about the kind of contingent nature of history Uh, because you often see a thread in stories about nuclear weapons. Well, it's inevitable that they would have been discovered. Not really. I mean, but for one man, Hitler, and, you know, the remaining Nazi physicists that were there as that as a possible threat, you know, had they assassinated Hitler in the late 30s, there was a bunch of attempts on his life. His own generals were plotting to kill him in 38 uh, after uh, before the Munich uh, agreement was made that if, you know, if the British and French go uh, respond, we're in trouble. We have to get rid of Hitler. Let's say one of those would have happened. No Hitler, no Holocaust, probably no World War II, therefore no nuclear weapons. Because we, you know, why would any country invest, you know, the equivalent of trillions of dollars today to develop that when you don't need to? There's no threat. So it may never have happened. It's a different version of, a, of, of history that is certainly interesting to think about. Yeah. yeah. But here we are. That's not the history we, we went on, right? So, um, okay. So uh, remember the story of... of um, What's his name? Petrov, Stanislav Petrov, the man who saved the world. All right, so his intuition there was 
you know, there's five blips on the screen. If the United States was launching a preemptive strike against the Soviet Union, they wouldn't send just five missiles. It'd be like 500 or something like that. So his instinct was this is a false positive, and that was correct. Okay, but in your scenario, uh, there there's just two nukes, right? So there must be in the government this idea like, okay, if it's the Soviet Union, it's probably going to be 500 or so, and that's one of our criteria for hit versus false positive. But if it's Korea, they probably aren't going to send one or two. So what is your sense about how our government thinks about that? Well, it's very specifically why I chose this scenario, because— Okay, so let's just bring listeners up to speed for a quick second, because people, m most people don't realize that a ballistic missile, a nuclear missile, an ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile, can get from one continent to another in around 30 seconds, 30 minutes. So actually from Russia, it's 26 minutes and 40 seconds, and from North Korea, it's 33 minutes. And so when you consider that kind of speed, coupled with the fact that the Defense Department has spent trillions of dollars preparing to take out an income, attempt to take out an incoming missile and move into the command and control counterattack position in minutes, then you really realize the, the reality that you're dealing with. And this brings us to a policy called launch on warning. OK, so nuclear war is never going to be or at least not the way the Defense Department plans for it. It's never going to be a 9-11 style attack, a Pearl Harbor, where just suddenly, you know, a nuclear weapon lands here in the United States with the exception of a dirty bomb. But a ballistic missile can be detected in one second because of our technology, our early warning technology. And so. When you think about that alongside the policy of launch on warning, then you realize why any scenario is going to wind up in nuclear Armageddon, as I explain in the book. And it's, it's as simple as this. So launch on warning is exactly like it sounds. Launch on warning. When we are warned of a nuclear attack and get secondary confirmation from ground radars, the president launches a counterattack. And that six minute window that he has is so that incoming missiles don't take out our missiles. So to your question, well, wait a minute, there's only two. Wouldn't maybe the president would think, oh, let's just sit around and wait and see what happens. That is just simply not how it works. And I'll quote Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, former, who said to me when we were having this discussion about the reality of launch on warning as a policy, he said, it's a policy. We do not wait, period. And so during the fire and fury days of President Trump, a lot of STRATCOM commanders, deputy commanders that were normally more reserved and didn't speak so openly about nuclear plans made bigger statements, including on CNN. And you, if you Google this, you can see General Hyten, he was the former STRATCOM commander, talking to Barbara Starr about exactly this. He says, and it's quoted specifically in the book, you know, North Korea needs to know if they launch a nuclear weapon at us, they launch one, we launch one. If they launch two, we launch two, right? So he's kind of like making it known. But if you look really deeper into that, you wind up at the missile expert, Bruce Blair, who is, he has died since, but he's arguably kind of America's sort of he was considered the sort of, you know, grandfather of nuclear command and control policies, having been a missileer himself and then working at Princeton with their security center. And what he said was actually, if North Korea launches one, we launch 82 in response. And he's written a very long monograph, which is sourced in the back of my book, where he breaks that down. Why? And so I follow his, poss his possibility. And when America launches its 82 nuclear weapons in response, which is called escalate to de-escalate, another kind of Orwellian concept, then you see what happens 
with some of the existing technology flaws in our system, including ones that were confirmed to exist, confirmed with me by former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. But this plan would only work if the other guy knows that's what you're going to do. So you have to kind of make it public. Well, I believe that's exactly what General Hyten was saying. And, you know, General Hyten didn't need to scare the pants off of everybody in America and say, you launch one, we're going to launch 82. I mean, and also that just sounds so profoundly aggressive, which mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. But that's what de-escalate de to de-escalate is. Yeah. I mean, it's the doomsday machine from Dr. Strangelove. You know, it's like, it only works if the other guy knows you have it. Why did you keep it a secret? <laughs> it is. It is. And one of the most haunting quotes I found was, you know, Stratcom during the, for a while, Stratcom had pinned on its Twitter feed, you know, deterrence. It, it had, in the book, I quote the exact um, statement. I don't want to ruin it. But it's along the lines of like, deterrence will hold no matter what, because we say so, right? But in a conversation, not classified, a conversation among, you know, those in the know, the deputy commander of STRATCOM, a guy called Lieutenant General Tom Bossier, gave a speech whereby he said, deterrence holds unless it doesn't, and then it all unravels. And that word unravels is really what I think about. And it really underpinned my narrative. Because that is exactly what happens, and it happens fast. Yeah, it's like that Mike Tyson quote about all the plans you have for the match until you get punched in the face. <laughs> I'm going to change it around and start quoting Mike Tyson. <laughs> so the launch on warning, uh, if I recall, President Obama was given the Nobel Peace Prize because he promised to end. Was it launch on warning or was it no first use? And then he he didn't do anything about it, and I figured, well, why not? His NATO, our native NATO allies, must have said, no, 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 you can't do that. I mean, it's a great question, and there's a couple examples of that, and I cite them in the book, whereby, you know, president the the president elect or or the, or when people are campaigning for president, they say they make these bold promises about getting rid of some of these outrageously dangerous policies like launch on warning. And then they enter office and poof, the issue disappears. And we don't know why. It's a very interesting mystery. You know, Leon Panetta, who was not only was he sec def, but before that, he was the um, director of the CIA. And before that, he was the White House chief of staff. And he hit my interview with him, gave a lot of context to the issues around the president, including the fact, as Panetta said, that the president is wildly unprepared for any of this. They don't want to deal with it. Clinton, by example, was preoccupied with problems in the White House. Um, but every president, it seems, from my interviews, is deeply uneducated about nuclear war, how it would unfold, how fast it would unfold, and what they would be required to do. I was imagine that that when you get elected, they take you in the back room and they go, okay, here's what's actually going on. <laughs> you know, you can't, we can't change uh, launch on warning, no first use, because our NATO allies will say this, and then we have to support them. And what if Putin does this? And they run through the game theoretic scenarios. And then the guy's like, oh yeah, okay. All right. But I promised I would. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> something like that or something even more terrifying that we don't know about but either right. way it leaves the rest of us sort of living on this razor's edge what i also found interesting and lo lo looping back for a second to your idea about civil defense you know the civil defense that never really was real kind of duck and cover and go into bomb shelters and whatnot you know this idea that the stratcom bunker the Bunker in Cheyenne Mountain, the Raven Rock Bunker, that they're sort of like nuclear war proof. That's pure fantasy. Um, I give you the actual specifics of what happens to those bunkers and why. And you realize everybody dies. You know, there's just no one wins. The famous quote from Reagan and Gorbachev, you know, a nuclear war cannot be, you know, can cannot be won and must never be fought. And so, again, going back to that idea of just this details one after the next of 
how quickly things unravel. The idea behind the book is really that people will become invigorated again to have these discussions and not just live like the ostrich with the neck exposed, you know, oh, I just, it's not really that bad. Or maybe they'll actually come to the realization that, you know, people's voices actually do count. One of my sources said to me once when I said, why on earth doesn't Congress do something about these crazy policies like launch on morning on down? And they said, Annie, Congress only does. Congress only pays attention to what the people are talking about. Hmm. Because they have elections coming up. Yeah, there's a practical aspect to that. Um, Why can't one of the responses be shoot down that missile? Look at Israel has the Iron Dome. They shoot down missiles all the time. Why wouldn't that work for an intercontinental ballistic missile? Just another great fantasy, another myth floating around there that just simply has absolutely no factual basis. Here are the specs on that. America has 44 interceptor missiles. So for listeners, the way an interceptor missile would work is you'd have a ballistic missile coming at the United States. A ballistic missile, that 30-minute missile trajectory we spoke of earlier, has three phases, okay? First one, boost phase, five minutes. That's where the the rocket is the gap. It's burning out the back. Five minutes. Now, then it's suddenly in mid-course phase where it flies 500 miles above the earth for 20 minutes. And the final phase is called terminal phase. Those are the last 100 seconds until the warhead re-enters the atmosphere and detonates on its target. Okay. The idea behind the interceptor missile is that while the ICBM is in boost phase, 500 miles above the earth, going something like between, you know, 20, I think it's going 14,000 miles and you're going an hour and you're going to then fire an interceptor missile at the incoming warhead in boost phase. The quote from the Missile Defense Agency spokesperson was that this is akin to shooting a bullet with a bullet. So when you close your eyes and get the visual on what is actually happening, then when I tell you the failure rate, it will make sense. Okay. The failure rate is between 40 and 55%. So, and those, by the way, are curated tests. That's when the defense department is like, Hey guys, we're going to be doing a test. So everybody have eyes on the systems. Imagine the frenetic situation with a launch, with an incoming missile. And the fact that there are only 44 interceptor missiles, you have to really consider that with the amount of missiles that Russia has, okay? So they have 1,670 nuclear warheads deployed on ready-for-launch status. And also, as we talked about earlier, if you're going to have a nuclear war, never mind like the two rogue launches from North Korea, if Russia is going to launch against the United States, it's going to send the mother load. So how are 44 interceptor missiles with that success rate of between 40 and 55 percent going to go up against 1,674 Russian nuclear warheads? And by the way, we have this, we have 1,770. And that says nothing of the thousands of weapons that are, you know, in storage. And so this idea that people have, well, they say, oh, we have a great interceptor system. It's like the Iron Dome. That is pure fantasy. Interesting. And also, by, also by the way, then when people say, well, wouldn't it be great if we just had, uh, you know, why don't we have thousands of missiles? Well, then you're getting into a military industrial complex yeah. number that, you know, goodbye education, bridges, roads, goodbye every other thing in America, and we're just, all we are is a defense nation. Well, we've already kind of gone down that road anyway with the number of nuclear weapons we've had. What, high of 30,000 plus? Now it's 1,700 launched on, ready, ready to be launched. And how many are in storage that, that, that could be readied? A couple thousand more? 
We have about 5,000. Russia has about 5,000. The numbers change, you know, every year. They're in the book. Their total nuclear armed nations right now is about 12,500 nuclear weapons. All right, we're back. Here's what happened, everybody. In the middle of this conversation, uh, the internet went out in my office. Uh, the skeptic's office is in this big professional business building. This has never happened before. So I thought, huh, that's a little spooky. <laughs> so anyway, we rescheduled, Annie and I rescheduled, and I uh, then went over to UPS to uh, mail some stuff, and their system was out. And I thought, oh, that's really frustrating. It's going to be one of those days. So I went to FedEx, and their system was out. What's the problem? The entire internet is out in all of Santa Barbara because it's Cox Cable, and they were doing something. Who knows what? So, And, and I'm not making this up, Annie. The guy in front of me goes, this is what it would be like if we had like a terrorist attack and took down the whole grid or if there was like a nuclear bomb and just took out the whole system. We'd all be screwed. I mean, think of the banking system and the food supply system. And I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> that's really funny because that's just what we were about to talk about. <laughs> so maybe pick us up there after millions of people are uh, killed from the initial uh, impact of, of, of the nukes and, and, and so on. What happens to the infrastructure and the grid and all that? So as you know, I write the book in three acts. We spoke about that. And um, what, once the bomb hits, the first nuclear strike, that is, at the Pentagon, um, you learn about nuclear weapons effects that happens to people, to the environment, to buildings. I... I can't recall if we spoke yesterday about, do we talk about where all this sourcing comes from? Because I think it's really, yeah. Yeah, we yeah, did yeah. talk about you, that. You, your primary sources are spectacular, really amazing. And, and again, I cannot get over the fact that once you really drill down on this stuff, you begin to realize that the descriptions that I give you are things learned by the Defense Department, starting with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and going through effects of the nuclear weapons tests in the Marshall Islands, the thermonuclear bombs. Of course, there were no people involved, but horrifically, they tested a lot of animals. You know, it was interesting reporting all this because it was a bit of a give and take of figuring out how much, how many gruesome details do you want to give to the reader uh, to keep their attention, but at the same time, not be so horrified and appalled by the death, the mayhem, the destruction that you go do your laundry. What was your effect, Michael, reading the book when you were reading the details about what happens to humans? Oh, well, particularly since uh, you talked about Diablo Canyon, I know that area quite well. Um, uh, the the Be Pismo Beach and all those areas. There's not that many roads. I ride my bike around there quite a bit. And those roads are jammed if it's just a sunny day and people are going to the beach. Uh, it's astonishing. So if there was something like a, a nuclear explosion there, uh, people would not be able to get out. Uh, I mean, it would just be traffic for forever. And um, yeah, then the then the you know just the electrical grid, the entire supply chain system would collapse. And I mean, just just getting past the uh, what was your estimate of several billion people worldwide, but maybe a hundred fifty two hundred million Americans dead. I mean, of course, people reading this think, well, I would, I, I'd be one of the ones that didn't die. Well, no, probably you wouldn't be. You'd probably be dead. And you'd probably be grateful to be dead uh, because it's not just, you know, if you survive, you get to start over. At the end of your book, you talk about, and Sagan talks about this too in, in Cosmos, the last episode, Who Speaks for Earth? You know, we'd be back to hunter-gatherers. It'd be way worse than being a hunter-gatherer because all the food supplies would be contaminated. The ground would be radiated. So it just seems it just seems complete insanity. That's right. And like to differentiate for our listeners, I the what you spoke of, the nuclear missile that hits Diablo Canyon, that was a distinctive choice of mine. Um, that is a missile hitting a nuclear power plant, which is known as the devil scenario among those in the know. And, you know. Tragically, ironically, apply whatever adverb or adjective you want to. When I was initially reporting this, I did get a little bit of pushback from some sources saying, you know, the idea of hitting a nuclear power plant with a nuclear missile is just so 
horrific. No, no one would ever even consider doing that. But of course, they they could and they would. And so, you know, in other words, I discussed this with sources about the the sort of onus of of putting that scenario into the book. And then when the Ukraine war began and we saw Russian forces attacking sites impossibly close to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and I began to listen to the director general of um, the International Committee on, on Nuclear Power Plants and Energy, you know, warning of how profoundly dangerous it is that the Zaporizhia plant could experience a core nuclear, a nuclear core materials meltdown. That is precisely what I describe in the book. And so, again, this is a scenario that is frighteningly plausible. And it's very important, I think, for readers to learn the difference between what happens when you actually strike a nuclear power plant versus, you know, a bomb against a city. There are profound differences, and that has to do with how radiation is dispersed. Um, and I went through this painfully with different sources, including uh, at Los Alamos, to really learn the factual parameters of what happens. And what we learned in Diablo Canyon, um, were this to happen, the land would be contaminated not just in through around California, the, the sort of middle section of California, all the way to Los Angeles, all the way to Nevada, and as one Los Alamos nuclear weapons engineer told me, perhaps even all the way to Colorado. You're talking about land ruined for thousands of years. Just one megaton bomb. No, that was a 300 kiloton. Oh, 300 kiloton. Warhead. Oh. Right. And again, not to get so wonky about this, but I needed to use as comps uh, warheads that I could specifically tag to Defense Department reports. So in 1979, there was a very famous, now famous report by the Office of Technology Assessment using a one megaton weapon. And yeah. so that's what I use in the, at the Pentagon in D.C., and then elsewhere, a lot of the effects pull from a 300 kiloton weapon. And so, again, you want readers to know the specifics. Um, at, at the same time, I'm hopefully moving people through this drama in the seconds and minutes that it's happening. So you're almost getting whiplash with how ridiculously bad one situation after the next unfolds. Yeah. Yeah, I quoted that um, that report in in the Moral Arc when I was writing about nuclear weapons, the effects of nuclear war. That was 1979. Estimated 155 million, 265 million Americans would die in an all-out Soviet first strike, uh, which was 49 percent to 73 percent. So you can, you know, almost double those numbers since 1979. I mean, just uh, you know, what the the COVID 19 was what point, uh, but like less than one tenth of one percent deadliness. Uh, or no, no, it was one percent, one percent worse than the flu. But you know, we basically shut down for two years over just that. I mean, you could just—I just can't imagine what would happen. I see since we uh, were or on yesterday, you you got your um, pick, picked up as a film uh, project, hopefully uh, dramatized, hopefully something like the day after, which I also rewatched after I read your book, and it it still. Holds pretty good, but it need, we need a new version of that to scare the crap out of people. <laughs> to do what? Well, to do something. So, okay, so let's talk about this. You know, why do we have a nuclear triad? To what extent is this just bureauc bureaucratic momentum and everybody wanting their fiefdom? And therefore, we need more and more weapons and a bigger budget because that's what we do. Versus there's a game theory logic to why we need these weapons for deterrence. And there's kind of a rationality behind it. That's right. And it's great to talk about the nuclear triad because, again, I'm trying to simplify things so that everybody can join the conversation and realize these are not like elite issues. They just are very practical. Triad means three. We have a nuclear triad. ICBMs, those are the silos in the ground. We have 400 of them. Nuclear armed, nuclear power submarines are the second part of the triad. They launch sub launch ballistic missiles, SLBMs. We talked yesterday about how it takes 30 minutes for an ICBM to get from one continent to the other. Well, a sub-launched ballistic missile, depending on where it is, can hit a target in under 10 minutes, Michael. 
this is fact. I reprint some documents from the Defense Department in the book that show how Russia and China's subs get within a couple hundred miles of the coasts of the United States. That is stunning. Third part of the triad are the bombers, the B-52s and the B-2 stealth bomber. We have 66 of them. Those are the only part of the triad that can be recalled. So you can send the bombers out and then you can call them back before they drop their bombs. They take multiple hours depending where they fly from. Um, And as it was said to me by the pilots who fly these systems, you know, almost everyone knows that they will not even be used because nuclear war happens so fast when the ballistic missiles launches that the bombers will not get to their targets. And even if they do get to their targets, as it was chillingly described to me, there will almost certainly be no aircraft to refuel the bombers. And so it will be a suicide mission. Yeah. Yeah. But again, back to the logic of why we're doing this in the first place. So this is called the Hibesian trap or the security dilemma or the other guy problem. Even if we didn't want nukes, the other guys got them. And and unless you had universal abandonment of all nuclear weapons with inspections and so on, no one's going to go to zero. It's just I can't see how we can get there simply because of the logic behind that. Uh, As deterrence does work, you know, under most circumstances, it's a really good thing to be able to deter aggression and violence from other groups or other people as a person or as a nation. Uh, The problem is, as you point out, is that the consequences of actually this form of deterrence is too too drastic to actually employ it. But how do we get out of that trap? You and I both know how many people spend their days, nights, and weekends arguing on one side of the other for deterrence. And may they continue arguing. That is not what nuclear war scenario is about. What it's about is showing what happens, showing what happens when deterrence fails. The best answer I can give when someone asks me about deterrence is a little vignette I put in the book. And it refers to a concept called apes on a treadmill. And this was a very interesting article in Foreign Policy magazine back in the 70s, whereby the author argued that the whole nuclear arms race was like a bunch of apes on the treadmill going to nowhere, beasts slavishly working away, just walking and walking and walking and getting nowhere. And, you know, uh, it, it became a sort of famous metaphor for how absurd the whole concept is really fundamentally. And I'm talking Orwellian absurd or, you know, Kafka absurd that at least from my position that, you know, more nuclear weapons make us more safe. I find that you know, an argument I'm not going to get involved in because it ends there of the absurdity of it to me. But the little twist on the apes on a treadmill anecdote, which I found very telling, comes from more recent times. And there was a group of scientists who were actually decided to put apes on a treadmill with oxygen mass and people on a treadmill in oxygen mass not having anything to do with nuclear deterrence, but rather to study the sort of origins, try to learn how humans became, you know, bipedal, how we began to walk on two feet instead of using four limbs. And the outcome is brilliant, right? So the scientist, one of the scientists does a, does an interview, I think it was with BBC, I quote it in the book, and he says how, um, Some of the apes must have sort of figured out how ridiculous this was. They actually hit the treadmill button and got off the treadmill. And so my question to all of those people who argue back and forth about deterrence is if the apes can figure out how to get off the treadmill, why can't humans? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people trying. Uh, I mean, after Reagan saw... Uh, the day after, he he did uh, initiate negotiations with Gorbachev. Unfortunately, they didn't uh, come to fruition as we would have liked. But, you know, I also read Sagan's book and also the papers you, you, you write about with the um, nuclear winter scenario with Tunes. Now, my my reading of it at the time, let's see, this about six, seven years ago now, was that 
more scientists were critical of the TAPS, Sagan, Tomb, the other guys who I forget their names now. <laughs> nuclear, we're in a scenario that it'd be more like a nuclear autumn or something, and, and only hundreds of millions would die instead of billions. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> okay, <laughs> set that aside for a second. What did Tune tell you about the updated models on that? So I'm going to make one comment first about the Reagan, the Reagan oh, reversal, yeah. I call it, right, before I get to Tune, which is that I do think it's hopeful. You know, you said, well, it didn't result in much. Well, it, to my eye, it certainly did, because in 1986, there were 70,000 nuclear warheads in the arsenals. 70,000. That is insane. Now, there are 12,500 among nine nuclear-armed nations. So to my eye, that is progress. And I believe that that mm -hmm. came from the Reagan reversal. And I say the Reagan reversal because for listeners who might not be so familiar with that, prior to seeing the day after, Ronald Reagan was an absolute nuclear hawk. He was pro-nuclear weapons. He was working on putting nuclear weapons in space, the SDI program, the Star Wars program. And he wrote in his presidential memoirs, he became greatly depressed his words after seeing the day after miniseries. And that led to him reaching out to Gorbachev. That led to communication. I see the solution as communication. You may not agree with someone. You may not agree with your adversaries, but my God, you can communicate with them and you can make progress. So as far as the tune of it goes, um, back in 1983, the nuclear winter theory was written by, as you say, five scientists one of whom was Carl Sagan, famously. The youngest of the group was Professor Brian Toon, Sagan's student. And he has been on this issue for all the decades since. And in our discussions, which were so interesting to me, you know, we went the gamut, right? So back in the 80s, of course, the Defense Department came out of the gate and said, this nuclear winter theory is Soviet propaganda. But I found documents that have since been declassified behind the scenes. They were absolutely aware that what the authors were writing about was totally legit. And I quote those in the book. And if you want to read them for yourself, you can go to the notes and find out where they are. And it's fascinating to me that people continue to say, oh, no, 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 it won't be nuclear winter. Oh, it might be nuclear fall or nuclear autumn. I mean, First of all, I mean, as you pointed out, oh, wow, you know, these numbers are just there. It's nuclear Armageddon. It is the truth that, as Nikita Khrushchev said, the survivors would envy the dead. But if you really look at the facts and figures of this and move away from the propaganda, from the people that might want to say, oh, that's exaggeration. You know, those are the I'm not going to fill in what they say, but you, um, what? What sh the climate modeling state of the art systems now demonstrate is that nuclear winter will be worse than was originally written about in 1983. The authors then thought that the sun would lose about 70 percent of its power from the soot in the air for about two years. Now that figure is between seven and 10 years. And so as Professor Toon explained it to me, large swaths, large bodies of water in the mid-latitudes will be frozen under ice sheets for years. Places like Iowa and Ukraine, the breadbaskets of the world, will be frozen over. And so, yes, as you point out, agriculture will fail, people will starve to death, and the numbers that are now reported from, again, state-of-the-art modeling systems, 5 billion people dead. And do you know what the minimum number of uh, nuclear weapons would be to not trigger a nuclear weapon, uh, a nuclear winter? That is to say, what if we had mm -hmm. 100 nukes as enough for deterrence, but that would not be enough to trigger a nuclear winter? That's a good point. And the authors do drill down on that. They write a scenario whereby they involve just, and again, there are different authors involved now, but... Um, uh, Pakistan and India, for example, they do an exchange between those two countries only, and they demonstrate what happens. So you can read about that. In the scenario that I worked from, I took the the author's number of 330 
billion pounds of soot being lofted into the air. And that is what causes the nuclear winter described in the book. And that is the exchange from the full forward deployed nuclear weapons on both, you know, between Russia and the United States, like a thousand five hundred approximately each. Um, and so you can if you do want to geek out on the numbers, please go to the back of the book and it refers you to all these different papers, which, you know, show those different scenarios. If you really want to kind of take the position of like, well, a hundred uh, uh, the exchange of a hundred nuclear weapons wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> well, it would be horrible, but it may not be the extinction of the species or, uh, you know, a nuclear winter for, for decades. That's right. You know, but that, to your point, have a look at what COVID did, right? And Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, it would be totally disruptive. Well, in Sagan's book, A Path Where No Man Thought, he concluded, I think that if we, if the entire world supply was less than a thousand nukes, that would be enough for deterrence. Uh, and yet not enough to trigger a nuclear winter. I don't mm -hmm. know what the numbers mm -hmm. are now. But it's curious why we need thousands, 12,500 right. now. So, I mean, if if you could completely destroy the hundred biggest cities in Russia, I mean, isn't that enough? Well, you're absolutely right. And that's, you know, where I think it would be fair to look at the military industrial complex of this. And again, that is not a conspiracy theory. You know, it's what Eisenhower spoke of, and it exists. And and we all see that, know that, and there are some legitimate issues with that, having to do with jobs, having to do with economic prowess. But when it comes to nuclear weapons, you know, the military-industrial complex should and must take a second seat to the survival of the species. Yeah. Uh, right. So how do you get from here to there? Well, if we could keep going— from 70,000 to 12,000 to, say, 1,200. Um, again, part of the problem, as Fred Kaplan points out, since you interviewed him, I'll bring him up because I read his book, The Bomb, I think it was, he was on mm -hmm. the show, that, you know, that the reason we had so many was just simply bureaucratic fiefdom and power and budgets. So we have to keep making these things because this is what we do. This is what our jobs are. And so they had to keep finding more targets in the Soviet Union. I think he gave one example of like some Air Force base in northern Siberia that's frozen over 10 months out of 12. And we had like 60 nukes uh, aimed at this thing. Why? I mean, one would do it and it's, it's probably don't even need to do anything to it. <laughs> but the reason is, is just bureaucracy. I mean, Kaplan has added so much to the dialogue. And of course, I read all of his books and it was really interesting when I was determining in my mind or thinking about how do I synthesize down some of these, you know, other amazing books, which demonstrate so clearly how we got here. And one of the ways I did that is in the sort of setup to the to the actual scenario kicking off with the first second of the nuclear launch was in writing this section called How We Got Here. And within that section, there's a section about the buildup. And what it came down to for me after learning all this information and just sort of, you know, sitting there with my hand, like, oh my God, right? I just decided to actually give you the years and the number of weapons with a little bit of commentary in between. And when you move through 1946 to the early 1960s, and you can quickly read the buildup of these numbers. And it, it, I think it says a lot because you realize, just as you pointed out, this was just madness and fiefdom. Madness and fiefdom. And yet that is the legacy with which we all live today. Yeah. Yeah, again, I remember reading Daniel Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine, in which he talked about being in the room with these people talking about the number of Americans that would die, 100 million, 150 million, like they're just tossing these numbers out. <laughs> That's uh, right. You know, abstractly. And since you uh, interviewed Harold Agnew, let me just read this great quote from him. Uh, Deterrence is what Agnew had in mind when he said he, he was at Los Alamos and he rode in a plane uh, filming the, the um, uh, Hiroshima explosion. Uh, he said he would require every world leader to witness an atomic blast every five years while standing in his underwear so he feels the heat and understands just what he's screwing around with because we're fast approaching an era where there aren't any of us left that have ever seen a megaton bomb go off. And once you've seen one, it's rather sobering. 
That's right. I, I actually did not interview Agnew. He died before I, I oh, got he to did. him. I thought you, yeah. well, you mentioned him, though. No, but... I did mention him because Los Alamos declassified some documents oh, for the it. book that I had requested about the origin story of the football, which is the president's emergency satchel that goes around with him 24-7, 365 days, so that he can launch a nuclear war in that six-minute window. And it was Agnew who was responsible for the origin story of the football. I mean, who sort of created the, Ooh, yeah. the link and the lock. And I tell the story in the book. And so that's perhaps what you think. But he also was, as you point out, the physicist flying in the follow-on plane and took that film, the only film footage um, from the air of the Hiroshima bomb, which is pretty stunning. But I, too, interviewed engineers who worked on the thermonuclear weapons and had that experience that Agnew writes about, whereby you feel the heat on your face. And again, they're watching from 50 miles, 30, 40, 50 miles out on a ship, and they have welder's glasses on. Um, but I remember them telling me that they lived in fear of the day when everyone had forgotten, or rather everyone alive, everyone who had been alive who had seen that, was dead, and so no one would remember. And that is pretty much where we are getting to now, which I think, or rather I know, is part of the reason why so many of the Cold War warriors who spoke to me on the record did, because they have that fear that where we are headed is a point of, is stemming from a lot of lack of information, lack of knowledge about the, the, history of the bombs. Yeah. When I was an undergraduate at Pepperdine, we had Ed, Edmund uh, Teller came and spoke. I think they gave him an honorary doctorate or something. And he pitched his mutual sure destruction and why we needed the super and all that stuff. I still don't really quite get why we need a super. I mean, why isn't a Hiroshima level bomb good enough for deterrence? You know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. It's like a couple, it's a very long conversation, but what I do know is I asked Richard Garwin, who is the man who designed the plans that allowed that thermonuclear weapon to explode. Teller could only think of it theoretically before Garwin. And I asked him if he wished that he had never drawn the plans. Would you like to know what he said? Yeah, what'd he say? Yeah. <laughs> he took a long pause and then he said he wished it couldn't have been drawn. Right. He didn't say he wished he hadn't drawn it, which is such an interesting uh, is scientific mind, right? It says a lot. Yeah. Although it wasn't long before the Russians had a super. So I guess once the genie's out of the bottle, theoretically, the fear is somebody's going to do it. So we should do it before they do it. And then you end up again in an arms race. Well, you're, uh, it's just, that is exactly the longer point is that, and again, having interviewed Manhattan Project scientists, and I actually write about this in Area 51 the engineers who wired that bomb, knew that um, the Russians were right around the corner from being able to have a super of their own. And that, at the time, made perfect sense to need to outperform the Russians. Yeah. You know, in all your books, you talk about uh, what goes on behind closed doors in these agencies. And I used a lot of your work in my book, Conspiracy, because there are conspiracies. There are people doing things behind closed doors that could affect us dramatically. This is the most, this is the biggest one. But, you know, MK Ultra and in the, in the paperclip and, you know, having these Nazi scientists come work for us. You know, there's endless stories that you talk about that, you know, if somebody says, well, what's a real, if you don't believe JFK and 9-11 truthers and all that, what do you believe? Well, the CIA did things like assassinate foreign leaders and rig foreign elections, and and they were doing things like that. Our government, uh, you know, it's astonishing, right. and it, some of that probably doesn't matter. MK Ultra mind, you know, mind control stuff. It doesn't affect that many people. Not going to affect me, but this one would. You're absolutely right, and I love looking behind the veil. I find it incredibly fascinating, and it comes from the idea that. I always believe there are multiple sides to any story, you know, and the truth is hard to find until it's not. And then you sort of open up one door and then you find another door. But ultimately, it's a journey. It's a quest. It's kind of like a it's like a 
part intellectual quest and also a part like very human, very almost emotional journey because I interview people who work on these programs and who sometimes find out later that they were perhaps part of something that they didn't understand the whole picture of. The best example of that, I remember I said, like, tell me what you mean. I was interviewing some guys at Area 51 who were working first on the U-2 spy plane for the CIA um, and then the A-12 ox cart, which was the aerial espionage precursor to the SR-71 plane of the Air Force. And they said that, like, you could be in one room working on, you know, the engine and in another room working on the windshield wipers, metaphorically, (laughs) and not know what the other guy was doing. And so it reminds me of that sort of fable about the elephant, right? Where if every, if you blindfold four scientists and they all have to feel a different part of the elephant, they're going to have completely different ideas about what they're dealing with. Think of the guy who's holding the trunk, the guy who's holding the foot, and the guy who's holding the tail or the ears, right? And so only when you take the blindfold off, do you really realize, oh, it's an elephant. But if you're just, if your window, your POV, blindfolded as it may be, is just what you can touch in front of you, it's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so one of my arguments against a lot of conspiracy theories is that people can't keep secrets and we do find out these things. But on the other hand, people do keep secrets, <laughs> like the SR-71 Blackbird. That was secret for a while. I mean, that was developed right here in Burbank in Southern California, for God's sakes. Uh, and nobody knew about it for a long time. And, you know, you, m- a lot of the stuff you wrote about was decades before we found out about it. That's right. I have had the privilege in my p- reporting career, because, of course, Nuclear War, a Scenario is my seventh book. I have been able to bring a lot of information onto the record for the first time. And that is a a wonderful thing to do as a journalist. And I stand on the shoulders of so many journalists before me because I often, if I'm reading about a subject, I will be looking at another journalist's notes in the back. And then if I want to know more, I will say, oh, the Bundes archive, you know, aisle 47, row 62. I'm going to go there and then I will go there. And lo and behold, the documents next to the documents next to the documents give me more information about the subject that I'm working on. So you know that too. We're all part of the same team trying to bring, okay, so I'm going to, on a positive note, you know, Eisenhower spoke about the military industrial complex when he was leaving office. But the second part of his speech was very near and dear to me as a reporter. And that's the part where he said, an alert and knowledgeable citizenry balances out the sort of need for the military. And that idea, an alert and knowledgeable citizenry, is precisely why I write the kind of books that I write. Yeah, that's a that's a perfect way to wrap it up. I know you got another heart out with some more interviews coming up here. Congratulations on making the New York Times bestseller list. You posted that yesterday on Twitter, and I looked at the at the books above yours, one of which was, I wish, I'm glad my mother is dead. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that book's about, but I thought, you should read Annie's book. <laughs> Everybody's going to be dead. <laughs> that was really funny. So if you get picked up by a, 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 a film, uh, if this actually gets made into a film, would you prefer a documentary or a drama? Oh, it's a drama. Oh, it's, it's a, a drama. drama, yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah. I, that's got to be the way to go. Remember the f- closing scene of the Planet of the Apes, where Charlton Heston's uh, going down the beach on the horseback with his with uh, Nova, the woman he's going to start a new species with, wondering what happened to the hominids on this foreign planet, and he comes across the Statue of Liberty and realizes An unforgettable image. I'm so glad we can end on that because that <laughs> is it's time to rego. It's time to go rewatch that. Planet of the Apes. Oh, totally. I, uh, I, I hope your book just scares the crap out of everybody. We actually do something about the problem. All right, Annie. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. It's been a pleasure.